Hey, folks, Eric Stackelbeck here. Welcome to a very special Friday edition of the Watchman Newscast live stream. And you've probably heard that the Middle East right now is an absolute tinderbox as it appears that an Iranian attack in some form or fashion on Israel, according to the U.S., according to President Biden, may be imminent. Now, as I come to you right now around 4.15 Central Time, where I'm at in Texas, 5.15 East Coast Time, p.m. in the United States, do we see the early stirrings of this Iranian so-called revenge attack against Israel? Hezbollah, Iran's most lethal proxy, and folks, this literally just came across the wire five minutes ago before I joined you. That's why I was a few minutes late. Hezbollah just unleashed a barrage of rockets and drones at northern Israel. Here's the details, breaking news here from the Times of Israel. Again, if you're just joining us, welcome everyone. Eric Stackelbeck here, Watchman Newscast, Friday afternoon, 515 Eastern. Here is what just came across the wire as we anticipate perhaps a larger attack. And we're going to break all this down. Lebanon's Hezbollah terror group. This is the Times of Israel. I'm just reading it right off my phone fired a large barrage of rockets at northern Israel on Friday night. Remember, it's nighttime in Israel. As Israel braces for an expected retaliatory attack by Iran or its proxies to the, to the alleged Israeli strike in Syria that killed several Iranian Revolutionary Guards Corps members last week. Now, Hezbollah has claimed responsibility for this. It was rocket fire, dozens of Katusha rockets, on the Galilee Panhandle in northern Israel, and they fired them at IDF artillery position, positions as well. Around 40 rockets were launched, according to Israel. Some were intercepted, thank God. Others impacted open areas or fell short in Lebanon. There were no reports of injuries in the attack. Also, Hezbollah sent two explosive-laden drones into northern Israel, and sirens were wailing across northern Israel as this rocket barrage commenced. Folks, I've been Israel in Israel at times when the sirens go off. It is not a very pleasant sound or a very pleasant feeling when you're running to a bomb shelter. I've done it. I've been there. But Israelis right now across the north are bracing themselves uh, near the Syria and Lebanon borders as we hear that Iran is indeed, and some say today, Friday, within the next 24 hours, Saturday, we've been hearing these rumblings really for the past almost two weeks since Mohammad Reza Zahedi uh, on Monday, what was that, April, I'm losing track of my dates, but almost two weeks ago, on a Monday, Zahedi was eliminated uh, by the IDF. Israel never officially claimed responsibility, but he and these other top officials from the Islamic Revolutionary Guards Corps were eliminated inside the Iranian consulate in Damascus. Now, Iran's been breathing threats of revenge ever since. Folks, they feel like they have the save to save face. We could be on the verge of a major Middle East war, and yet God Almighty still sits on the throne. You might say, what's he talking about? This is a news channel from a biblical Christian perspective and folks, I don't know, without that perspective, I don't know how you live or at least live with any sort of peace, especially in today's upside down world where good is called evil and evil is called good. I think that's what sets us apart here at The Watchman. We'd love to join us. If you like what you're hearing, we'd love you to join us here as subscribers. Just click that subscribe button, hit the notification bell. We're here mostly every day with these breaking updates. And for such a time as this, this is since October 7th, this has been the most precarious time for the state of Israel, I believe, in its modern history. Now, let's kind of unpack the state of play right now. Here's what we know. Joe Biden today, for what it's worth, said, and I don't know that he should have said this, but he said he expects the Iranian response to the takeout of Zahedi last week and those Revolutionary Guards member, the response to come soon, perhaps within hours. I guess a good thing there, and Iran is dropping hints about that as well, I guess a good thing is the Iranian regime perhaps does not have the element of surprise. This gives Israel time to get its missile defense into position, missile defense batteries into position to plan their own response, because Israel is going to have a response. Trust me, we'll talk about that more in a minute. But Biden said his message to Iran, don't. One word, don't. Now, 
how seriously does Iran take that? Uh, he also said that, I believe, to Vladimir Putin and to others, and they didn't heed Biden's warning. So he's saying don't. Uh, he's not exactly the most forceful, convincing figure if you're an enemy of Israel or America. But the Iranian regime reportedly, according to reports coming out of the region, is indeed concerned about the U.S. possibly getting involved. Now, I had a very interesting interview yesterday with Jonathan Shanzer. He's a top Middle East expert. He knows everyone in the region, travels frequently to the region. He's at the Foundation for Defense of Democracies in D.C. and just on the cutting edge of everything happening. I interviewed John for my nightly show on TBN, Stackelbeck Tonight, reminder, every Monday through Friday, 7.30 p.m. Eastern and 10.30 p.m. Eastern time on TBN. And Jonathan Shanzer said, look, Gaza is one thing. Yes, the Biden administration has essentially tied Israel's hands in some ways. In Gaza, it's a debacle, and Israel wants to finish the job in Gaza, go into Rafah, and eliminate Hamas, this demonic death cult, once and for all. The Biden administration is wailing and weeping and gnashing its teeth over how Israel is conducting its Gaza campaign, so it's a bit of a lull right now, perhaps calm before the storm there. But when it comes to Iran, according to Jonathan Chanzer, this top expert, a friend of mine, the Biden administration may be much more uh, accepting of a strong Israeli response. And perhaps, according to him, the U.S. may even get involved in some capacity. I have been doubtful about that. This administration, I believe in Washington, D.C., has been long on bluster and not even bluster, I, I should say it. Many times the public statements to me are cringeworthy, where it's basically saying, Iran, please don't hurt us. For instance, with the Zahedi strike, which I mentioned, the Biden administration through back channels was telling Iran, hey, we didn't have anything to do with it. It was all Israel. We didn't do it. I mean, it doesn't exactly transmit a message of strength and deterrence, needless to say. And we talked about this on the newscast over the past few months, right? The Biden administration sent warships to the region, off the coast of Lebanon, and it was there. Here's the bottom line, folks. Is there teeth behind these statements by Joe Biden and U.S. officials? And does Iran believe that? Does Iran believe there's conviction and a willingness to act and use U.S. force behind just the statements? It's not, I shouldn't say bluster is threats. It has been bluster. It's been very measured. And measured can be good, no doubt, in statecraft. But I have felt that the Biden administration statements vis-a-vis -vis Iran have not been nearly as forceful enough, and that's an understatement. So now the rubber hits the road, and now we're there. We're de we're de we're on a collision course here, Iran and Israel. What does the Biden administration do? What does the U.S. do? That's kind of one of the big elephants in the room, so to speak, as we observe the situation. But the state of play is this. Iran may strike imminently, according to the U.S., according to other intelligence officials around the world. Does imminently mean today? It's like, again, it's 525 roughly Eastern time. So it's uh, you're past midnight in Israel right now, just past midnight. It's about 1223 in Israel right now, a.m. Could it happen in the middle of the night, Israel time. Could it happen tomorrow, Sunday? We don't know. And this isn't, look, as a follower of Jesus uh, and as a believer in the God of Israel, the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, I'm commanded not to have a spirit of fear, but of power and of love and of a sound mind. And I have to trust God here. I have to believe when he says, I will never, never leave you or forsake you, he really means it. And when it comes to Israel, he neither slumbers nor sleeps. So this is not a time to hide under your desk and say, oh, my word, the sky is falling. No, in situations like these, that's where God does some of his best work. So we shall see. But look, I think you'd rather know than not know. And that's why we have this channel. The Bible says my people perish for lack of knowledge. My people are destroyed for lack of knowledge. This is no time to mince words. And you need the kind of intellectual ammo and knowledge that you can share with your loved ones, not only for what's going on in the Middle East, but what's happening in this upside-down world 
writ large all around. So that's why we do what we do. But how does Iran strike? And again, I'm not trying to be doom and gloom and fatalistic on a Friday afternoon. I get it. We're going into the weekend and you're talking about wars and rumor of rumors of war. Folks, it's reality. And we can be ostriches and put our head in the sand and say, well, it's not going to affect me. Eventually, it's going to come to your doorstep. Trust me, you'll be eaten last. That old statement by Winston Churchill, the crocodile eats that person last, the appeaser. And I'm not saying one's an appeaser, but the average person doesn't want to hear about guns and bombs and rockets on a Friday. I get it, but it is what it is. And that's why we're here to provide you with information that you need for you and your family. And I preface what I'm about to say by saying that, because look, here is the prediction by all the analysts and everyone else. This is what's being bandied about. And I'll tell you what I think. Well, number one, one possibility is that Iran, and look, this could happen while we're in the midst of this live stream. My trusty producer, Daniel, will be in my ear telling me if it does, and we'll have a breaking update. But does Iran carry out that retaliatory attack? And again, folks, they feel like they have to save face. The elimination of Mohammad Reza Zahedi and those other Islamic Revolutionary Guards Corps members was big. It hurt. Zahedi was in charge of all of the Iranian regime's terror operations in Lebanon and Syria. That's big. He was very involved with Hezbollah and their jihad against Israel. It, it, it can't be understated, the impact. And just the, the, the boldness, the brazenness of Israel to strike the Iranian consulate in Damascus and take these individuals out. So does Iran react, number one, here's option number one, the way I see it, for what it's worth. Does Iran react, and I'd love your thoughts on this. Hey, active chat here, people from around the world, thousands with us right now, thousands more before the time we're done. Let me know what you think. Does Iran fire rockets, missiles, drones from Iranian soil against Israel? Big question. Because, folks, if Iran, that, that's option number one. Uh, let's see right here. I'm getting some updates here. Interesting. Okay, that's option number one. That would be a new level. Iran has always, ladies and gentlemen, acted through proxy, has it not? When have you seen Iran directly strike Israel, mano y mano, as they say, from sovereign Iranian soil towards sovereign Israeli soil. You haven't seen it. It's always been Iran lurking in the shadows and acting through its proxies, through its ring of fire that surrounds Israel on all sides, Hezbollah, Hamas, Palestinian Islamic Jihad, the Houthis in Yemen, the militias in Iraq and Syria. So for Iran to launch rockets, missiles, drones from Iranian soil, number one, a whole new level, a whole new provocation. Number two, Folks, that gives Israel the green light to respond with overwhelming force, not in Lebanon or Syria or Yemen or Gaza, but in Iran proper, to take the fight to Iranian soil. And you will see Israeli fighter jets quite possibly in the skies above Iran if Iran directly strikes Israel from Iran. And it's not just me saying it. Israel's foreign minister and defense minister have said exactly the same thing over the past few days. That's option number one, I guess you would say. And a sub note to that, if Iran does that, would Iran target civilian centers? I had someone ask me today, Eric, off the record in a conversation here, do you believe that Iran would strike Tel Aviv, would strike civilian centers? Now, if Iran believed this was the moment, their apocalyptic moment where their Messiah, they call him the Mahdi, the Islamic Messiah returns and, and hell on earth is unleashed through Iran. And that's what they believe. Just so you know, folks, the leadership in Tehran, not the Iranian people, but this wicked regime, they have an apocalyptic mindset with radical Islamic eschatology. If they believe this is it, and I don't know that I believe that, that they think this is the moment, then they would indeed hit civilian centers because they're going all in. Because if they hit Israeli civilian centers, again, Israel is going to respond with overwhelming force inside Iran. Does Iran is a more likely scenario, and again, 
weigh in here. What are your thoughts? Weigh in. We've got a great chat going here, and I'm glancing at it. I want to hear what you think. We have a very informed audience here at The Watchmen. We love you here with us every day as Watchmen and women all on the wall. Be sure to subscribe for such a time as this. Or does Iran hit military targets, that kind of infrastructure? Folks, I have to say, either way, if Iran thinks it's going to soften the blow of the Israeli response by not hitting civilian targets, only hitting military targets, I think they're sadly mistaken. I can tell you, I was in Israel a few weeks ago, actually about, gosh, about a month and a half ago now, time flies, but the people of Israel are resolute. I will tell you, everyone listening right now, we've got thousands, everyone listening right now, know this, October 7th changed everything. It will never be the same. I said it on October 7th and October 8th here on the Watchman YouTube channel. It's never going to be the same. The people of Israel are permanently scarred from it and permanently changed by it. I'm an American. I was living in America, obviously, United States, on 9-11. And if you're an American like me, you know how it was on 9-11 in the immediate aftermath. Patriotism, unity, if only we had that today in America. That's another story. But the people of Israel are like that right now, folks, but on several higher levels. Because consider this. On October 7th, the attack was, if you average it out to Israel's population versus the U.S. population, the attack on Israel on October 7th, 1,200 people slaughtered in cold blood in a Hamas invasion, it was several magnitudes higher than 9-11. So the effect on the psyche of the people of Israel cannot be understated. And the personal nature of it, where people, if you can call them that, savages, Hamas terrorists, very up close and personal, slaughtered children in their bed in front of their parents. That is something, if you're an Israeli, it, it was a whole other level of demonic evil. And that sticks with you. And the people of Israel right now are united, they're resilient, they're resolute. They're not in the mood, let's just say, for finger-wagging from the world after they were brutalized on October 7th. And after Hezbollah, by the way, has been firing rockets and missiles since October 8th at northern Israel to the point where at least 80,000 Israelis in the north are evacuated. So I'm sorry. Israel right now is not in the mood to hear about ceasefires, UN resolutions, Palestinian statehood, and other platitudes from the West. I say all that to say, Iran may overplay its hand here. And it, of course, there's levels to this. It may depend, okay, on the magnitude of the Iranian attack, number one. It may depend on the where the attack originates from, number two. Does it originate from Iran? Then it's open season. That could affect the Israeli response. But I would say this, folks. Israel may be prepared to unleash hell in a way that it hasn't before. What I'm saying to you is this, to put it even more in layman's terms, Israel's in no mood to mess around. They're not playing games after October 7th. And they may just want to send a message to Iran, and I mean a message, magnitudes higher than has been sent before and directly. And that holds for the second scenario. If Iran decides here to act through proxy, the old MO, right? Hey, we didn't do it. I call it implausible deniability when it comes to the Iranian regime. They act through Hezbollah, Hamas, Islamic Jihad, then they say, we didn't do it. We only funded, trained, supported, helped plan it, but we didn't actually pull the trigger. Again, Israel's not in the mood to hear that anymore. And Israeli leaders are saying more and more, we're going to the head of the snake, the head of the octopus, the Iranian regime. October 7th changed everything. You saw it last week with the takeout of Zahedi and those Islamic Revolutionary Guards officials in a consulate in Damascus. We've seen it for months with the consistent takeout of Iranian officials and jihadi leaders in Syria. Israel's not playing games, nor should they. So even if Iran, with that second option being discussed, acts strictly through Hezbollah, Islamic Jihad, and the militias in Syria, Iraq, the Houthis in Yemen, 
And there's been, by the way, a lot of speculation that the attack's going to happen either on southern Israel, think a lot, Red Sea, Houthis, militias, or the north, of course, Lebanon, Syria. But in the center, the U.S. has issued a travel advisory, and the U.S. is saying, look, stay in Jerusalem or Tel Aviv, like don't go north, don't go south, because that could be the most likely targets. Even if Iran decides they're going to act through proxy, Israel still may react directly against Iran with overwhelming force. Again, it's a new day. And Israel might say, you know what? Why isn't Iran paying any consequences? And I think Israel's been saying that. They've been behind this for, oh, I don't know, 45 years since the 1979 Islamic Revolution. When is Iran, the head of the snake, going to pay any consequences directly? At times, Iran has, as officials have been taken out, et cetera. But Iran has pretty much had carte blanche and operated freely and stood back and laughed and gloated as its proxies that they've built up around the region have done all their dirty work and advanced the Iranian cause. Hey, the Persian leadership in Iran is always willing to fight to the last drop of Arab blood, remember. But that Persian regime in Iran does not want to get its own hands dirty. It tries to avoid it at all costs. But guess what? They overplayed their hand on October 7th. October 7th doesn't happen without the Iranian regime. And you could say, well, Iran didn't know that Hamas was going to move on that day. Maybe Iran didn't know Hamas was going to move on that day, but they knew Hamas was going to move on some day soon. Even if Hamas acted before they had the approval of their Iranian overlords. And why do we know that? Because for years, Iran has been training, funding, and equipping Hamas to do exactly what it did on October 7th, to the point where a few weeks before October 7th, in mid September, we had some 500 Hamas and Palestinian Islamic Jihad operatives in Iran training. They weren't training for. Uh, a soccer match. They were training for jihad, folks. And you saw the bitter fruits of that on October 7th, a few weeks later. So now Iran is in the very uncomfortable position of having to consider the, consider the possibility that it's directly pulled into the fight. That's the last thing Iran wants to do. The very brave ayatollahs in Tehran, they always want to go through proxy. Now, they may not have a choice, folks. They have to save face. And even if they try to do it through proxy, Israel might say, the rules of the game have changed, and we're going after you directly. Third possibility here that's being bandied about, and this is part of Iran's MO over the years, I would say, that Iran acts against Israeli embassies or consulates around the world that it doesn't strike Israel proper, that it strikes, God forbid, an embassy or a consulate. And there's a track record here, a long track record of Iran targeting diplomatic facilities, Jewish targets, synagogues, God forbid, again. It's a third possibility. I think the least likely option here is number four, Iran does nothing. Again, I said at the top, everyone seems to think and know this is coming. At some point, this Iranian revenge attack against Israel. No one knows, I think, the means by which Iran's going to do it. There's a lot of speculation. But everyone seems to think and know that it's coming. But that's all we do know. And I think, in a sense, the fact that it has been telegraphed so much and everyone knows it's coming could benefit Israel. If there was an element of surprise here, like October 7th, which seemingly to the average person came out of the blue, but there were intelligence warnings and rumblings beforehand, um, that's different. Does Iran wait a few weeks and do this out of the blue? That doesn't seem to be the intel on the ground, as they say. It seems more sooner rather than later, but anything can happen. So here on this channel, 
we try to prepare for any contingency. I hope I'm wrong and that none of this happens. And I'm not saying this is happening tonight. I'm not a date setter. Never have been, never will be. That's foolish and it's not biblical. But what I am saying to you is this. Things are very precarious right now. And if things happen over the weekend, say tomorrow, say Sunday, we'll be back with you live. Just so you know, we'll be ready to roll, folks. This is why we do what we do for such a time as this. We're here for you. And we want to walk with you through this, this very tumultuous time, a perilous time, but Bible times, and I believe prophetic times. So where does that leave us? in terms of the prophetic. Again, this is news from a biblical perspective. Where does that leave us all? And I see a very active chat room here. I see a lot of trolls, and I apologize to our regular viewers that we've got the trolls. Uh, is there any more just vicious trolls out there than the pro-Hamas trolls? I mean, I digress. And that that should that's uh, I think understood, but hang in there, everyone in the chat room, and do what you do, and and hopefully we can change some hearts and minds, some road to Damascus type conversions. That's what we're hoping for. But from a biblical perspective, okay, what's the state of play there? I believe a few things. I think number one, October seventh, unleashed something. I, I believe 9-11 unleashed something spiritual. I, I truly do. Things just haven't been the same since. And every year people say, oh my gosh, it used to be, I said this on New Year's, it used to be on New Year's Eve, at least here in America, there was a sense of optimism. What's the new year going to bring? This is great. Oh my gosh, it's going to be my best year ever. Now, I don't know about you, but it seems most people are walking around when the new year rolls around and saying, Oh my gosh, last year was terrible. What's the next year going to bring? Is it going to bring wars, rumors of war, pestilence, famine, earthquake? Now what? The last year was bad. Is this next year going to be even worse? And I mean, I'm sad to say that's not my view as, as a believer, as a follower of Jesus. God gives you the peace that surpasses all understanding and he steals you for the storms to come because when the boat, you're in the boat. The waves are crashing. The winds are roaring. Jesus is in the boat with you. And knowing that gives you tremendous confidence and peace, even when you head into the roughest storms. And we're heading into one right now. But many people don't have that. They don't have that insurance that only Jesus can bring. And there's a sense of dread. I don't want you to leave this live stream today with a sense of dread. No way. We want you to leave encouraged and inspired but also knowing the state of play, so to speak. Again, I said earlier, I'll say it now, the Bible says my people are destroyed for lack of knowledge. No time to be an ostrich. So you need to know what's going on. But prophetically, floodgates were opened, I think, on 9-11. That was some really demonic spirits unleashed then on the world, not just America. But October 7th, have you ever seen a more demonic act in your lifetime than that heinous butchery and massacre? Of course not. I believe October 7th, I believe what we're seeing right now are prophetic preludes, so to speak, where groundwork is being laid for larger prophetic events to come. What do I mean by that? Chiefly, the book of Ezekiel, chapters 38 and 39. Now, it's a funny name. You may, you may not have watched this channel before. You may never have picked up a Bible in your life. And you may not never have heard of this, but it's called the War of Gog and Magog. You might say, huh? It's a term you need to know. It's a war you need to know. It hasn't happened yet. But the Bible is very clear that the day is coming when it will happen. I believe. And I may be wrong. I'm not omniscient. <laughs> Only God is. And here's a good thing. Let me preface this by saying... It's not a salvation issue, folks. We can disagree on the participants in and the timing of the War of Gog and Magog, and we're still all brothers and sisters in Christ. We can disagree on the timing of the rapture, and we're still all brothers and sisters in Christ. These are not salvation issues. They can be lovingly and respectfully debated, but we're still all one body, okay? Let me just say that. But I believe that Russia, Iran, which is called Persia, 
that was its ancient name in the book of Ezekiel, and Turkey will be the chief participants in a latter days invasion force that comes against Israel, that Ezekiel lays out very clearly. He says, latter, L-A-T-T-E-R, latter days. And I think the groundwork is being laid for that now. I can't tell you, folks, what's going to happen in the next 24 hours or the next hour when it comes to Iran and Israel. But I can tell you something is going to spark things, Not I'm not saying this current round, but things will continue to happen that spark larger things and larger conflicts and flare-ups. And I think it's building towards that Ezekiel war. Russia and Iran have never been more united than they are now. Throw Turkey in the mix as well. Russia, Iran, and Turkey, friends? They've been at each other's throats for centuries. Now, magically, over the past, or demonically, over the past few years, they've become very close. Russia is at Israel's doorstep. We've been reporting here on the Watchmen that they are moving closer and closer to the Golan Heights. And Russian forces, they have bolstered their forces along the Israel-Syria border. Iran is obviously in Syria. They're aligned with the Assad regime in Syria. Hezbollah's there. The world's worst actors are there. Turkey's there. So they're all there in the shadow of the mountains of Israel. Now, here's the good news. I want you to go and read Ezekiel 38 and 39, number one. But number two, I'm going to give it away. I'm going to, spoiler alert, Israel wins. I shouldn't say Israel wins. God wins. The God of Israel prevails in this war because Israel is completely overwhelmed here. It's got this invasion force on its northern doorstep. And Ezekiel is very clear that God intervenes in this war directly and shows his face in a very public way in a way that he hasn't in 2,000 years. And he rains down just his force, his might, on these invading armies, and they perish on the mountains of Israel. So again, I told you we're going to encourage you. Don't hide under your desk. If you are, peek up and take a listen, because Israel's going to be, I don't want to say Israel's going to be okay. The time of Jacob's trouble may be upon us, but Israel is going to survive. Book of Amos is very clear. God says, I have brought my people back to their ancient and ancestral homeland, the land I gave them, never, key word there, never to be uprooted again. So Israel is going to withstand this and survive it, but it's going to be ugly, folks, at times. It's not going to be easy. Pray for the peace of Jerusalem. Pray for Israel right now. What a precarious time. Again, and also, I didn't even mention, we're talking the prophetic, Isaiah 17. Two almost companion verses. I don't know the timetable of it, but I will tell you, Ezekiel 38 and 39, that war of Gog and Magog, it's not been fulfilled. I will tell you, secondly, Isaiah 17, chapter 17, verse 1, the book of Isaiah, has not been fulfilled, in my view, where it says Damascus, the capital of Syria, will become, quote, a ruinous heap. It will cease to be a city. Now, Damascus is one of the world's oldest inhabited cities. It's never been completely destroyed, but the Bible suggests a day is coming when that's going to happen. I take no delight in that. Damascus, again, an ancient city, a biblical city, but something's going to happen to precipitate that. You're in prophetic times, but all is not lost. Anything but for the believer, these are the times where we are called to be ambassadors for Christ to be salt and light, and to help show others the way, to be light in the darkness. And there's going to be a lot of people in your life, folks. And look, I hope this is a complete dud. I hope nothing happens this weekend or at all. I hope Iran blinks and backs down. I hope so. But eventually, you and I both know that there's going to be some nasty stuff happening. There's going to be people in your life that are going to be nervous and scared and, oh my word, what are we going to do? You're going to have an opportunity there to speak into their lives, to share Jesus with them, and to just let the Holy Spirit speak through you and provide comfort and peace to friends, co-workers, neighbors, loved ones. Be ready and always have, as the Apostle Peter said, always have something to say, basically. Always have the words to say to explain the peace that's in you. 
and why you carry yourself differently than everyone else. How is this guy, this Christian, this Jesus guy over there, the, the world is collapsing. How does he have such peace and joy in his heart still and confidence? One word, Jesus. He's the way, the truth, and the life. Now, how can you bless Israel? I want to talk about that in a minute, but I just want to close and tell you once again that we're here for you here at the Watchman. If things develop, if anything happens, we're going to come to you this weekend with updates. I can't come to you in the middle of the night. I'll be in bed, but when I wake up, we'll have a, we'll have a plan, okay? Remember, Israel's seven hours ahead, but prayer works. Stay in prayer throughout this weekend. Pray without ceasing. Please, I implore you. And number two, if you want to bless Israel, and a lot of people are asking in the chat and asking generally, how can I help? I can't get to Israel. I feel helpless. I want to bless Israel. Well, our good friends at Mayor Panim, you've heard me talk about them. You don't hear me talk about a lot of organizations or companies. There's a handful that I work with that I believe in that I know personally. Mayor Panim is one of them, folks. Visit mpgive.org. That's mpgive.org. You're going to see the URL there up on your screen. And why do I say this? Mayor Panim is doing God's work on the ground in the most perilous time for Israel since 1948. Mayor Panim runs incredible soup kitchens. And you might think of a soup kitchen and think it's kind of a, you know, not the most romantic, not romantic's not the word, but not the nicest place. Let's just say that. These are top-notch facilities that Mayor Panim runs. And they are feeding and clothing and providing humanitarian aid for thousands and thousands of needy Israelis. Children, women, the elderly, Holocaust survivors, the impoverished, Israel's most vulnerable, their most needy, Mayor Panim stepping into the breach and stepping up and blessing them and giving them hope and giving them meals at a time, look, where Passover is upon us nearly. Passover is like in another week, folks. And many Israelis right now, this is the most important day or the imposed important period, I should say, on the Israeli character uh, calendar, Passover. But you have tens of thousands of Israelis in the south, close to 100,000 in the north, evacuated from their homes with no return date. Where will they spend their Passover? One of the great things Mayor Panim is doing is they're stepping up there. They're going to help provide Passover meals for these needy Israeli families. I mean, this is good stuff. So you're looking for a way to fulfill that biblical mandate. Genesis 12, 3, bless the people of Israel. Mayor Padim is a good place to start. It's mpgive.org. Check them out. Support their great work. Hey, a heavy message to deliver today, but we try to provide plenty of biblical encouragement as well. Hang in there. And if something happens over the weekend, we'll be back with you. Until next time, whenever that is, God bless you, and remember, never hold your peace. Hey, everyone, thanks for checking out the Watchman Newscast. Make sure you hit the subscribe button so you never miss an upload, and tap the bell icon so you're notified every time a new video is posted. And don't forget to share your thoughts, insights, and comments below. Thanks for watching. We'll see you.